Well, this is a dog collar museum. And that usually causes visitors to ask you to repeat what you've just said, and it is just that. It's a museum full of dog collars. I'm particularly drawn to the more gruesome looking collars that we have here in, in this particular case. They look very vicious, but in fact they were to protect the dog, hunting dogs, when they were out, for instance, hunting wild boar or anything that might have gone for the throat of the dog. The dog had a collar on with these spikes pointing outwards to protect the dog from its quarry. Yes, indeed, there is a dog collar museum and it's at Leeds Castle. The first thing I must point out to you is that Leeds Castle is nowhere near the large industrial city of Leeds in Yorkshire. It's near the tiny rural village of Leeds in Kent. And that's where we are now. It's a relatively small castle with large grounds, a golf course, an aviary, and a maze. Oh, it's beautiful. Just exquisite. This is just absolutely breathtaking. And it's just, Leeds Castle is just one of the most famous and loveliest of all the castles. Favorite with the queens, I heard, and I can see why. I love the maze. <laughs> it was fun. How long did it take you to get up here, do you think? We were about 25 minutes, but I had a guide. I cheated. <laughs> Miss the last opening, go straight across. That's straight across. That's Jack Pink, one of the guides here at Leeds Castle. He spends a lot of his time rescuing lost adults from the maze. All mazes stem from the labyrinths, which in Greek mythology house the Minotaur. Um, from then there have been various developments. This particular maze uh, is peculiar to Leeds Castle insofar that it incorporates a chalice bowl in the centre, which is a welcome to, to, to Leeds Castle, and also incorporates a queen's crown. Um, it's not a concentric maze, so therefore if you come in and do all right, lefts and all rights, it doesn't necessarily get you to the middle. But you don't have to worry about getting out, because you go then from the mound in the centre, down through into the grotto and into a tunnel and out. And when you emerge from the grotto, you see again a very pretty castle with an immense amount of history. Well, Henry VIII owned Leeds Castle. He owned 55 castles. Some of them he never visited. This one he visited only on four separate occasions. But during his ownership of it, a modernization took place in the 16th century. He turned it really from a fortress into a royal palace. 55 castles. Isn't that rather excessive? I asked Andrew Wells, the curator, why kings needed all these castles. The kings of England needed castles all over the country. Um, they needed to ensure that their supporters were um, covered the country in defensive locations. They also needed safe places for their queens and their mothers and mothers-in-law and so on to live. It is indeed true that Leeds Castle does feel more like a home than many of the larger fortified castles you'll have seen. There is definitely a woman's touch about the place, like the Queen's Room. The important thing to understand in this room is that it isn't a bedroom, it's a state room. It's a room where the Queen would have received important visitors. She would have given audiences here. In bed? Probably not in the bed, no. She might have sat on the bed. She's more likely to have sat on the throne beside the bed. But the bed is there as a medieval status symbol to impress the visitors. It, in an age when few people owned beds, you had to be pretty rich to have a bed at all. To have one so very large and so elaborately draped was very much an indication of your high status in life, of your prestige, and that's what the bed is about, impressing the visitors. It was used occasionally um, when there were situations where it was necessary to have witnesses present, for example, for royal births and royal deaths, but not normally for sleeping in. Now tell me what would happen, for example, with a royal death approaching. Well, when the king or queen was nearing death and it was clear that that was what was going to happen, they would be removed from their own bed into the state bed. It would by then have been draped with black drapes. There would be persons of high office around to be present when the king or queen died. 
And uh, the reason you needed witnesses for royal births was to ensure that the baby that was produced was actually the child the Queen had born and that it wasn't an imposter, if you like, that somebody hadn't sneaked one in in the warming pan or that the child hadn't been stillborn and a, a different child brought in. So that is why there were witnesses present to ensure that nothing went into the, the area where the bed was other than the midwife. That's Daphne Harford, one of the castle's excellent tour guides. Leeds Castle has many American connections. The last private owner of the castle, Lady Bailey, was an American. The castle is now run as a charitable trust. But Daphne Harford told me about a far earlier American connection. Well, this is Catherine Culpepper as a very young child, and she's quite important in the history of the castle. The castle was owned by the Culpepper family during the Civil War in England, and luckily for us, Cheney Culpepper sided with Oliver Cromwell, and the castle escaped Emmy damage during the Civil War. But sadly for him, with the restoration of the monarchy, uh, Cheney Culpepper died penniless, and the castle was bought by his cousin, Thomas. Thomas had supported Charles I and had been rewarded by Charles I with five million acres of land in the United States, in Virginia, between the Rappahammock and Potomac rivers. And uh, Catherine Culpepper, his only heir, married the fifth Lord Fairfax, carried the castle, therefore, from the Culpepper to the Fairfax family, and the Fairfaxes followed up the American connection in Virginia, and there are still parts of uh, Virginia, I understand, named after the Culpeppers and the Fairfaxes. When you've toured the castle, you'll want to enjoy the magnificent grounds. Perhaps you'll bump into Laura Patterson, head birdkeeper at the aviary. The aims of the aviary are to um, present to the public um, a collection of birds, um, some of which are endangered, and it is uh, the, the breeding of all the birds within the aviary, not only the endangered species, which are speaking to you right now. <laughs> um, Who's that? Those, those are the hyacinth macaws. They are one of the most endangered species that we have here. Um, we have several species of um, macaw which have bred. The hyacinths we've got haven't been together very long, so they haven't bred here yet. But we have been awarded two first breedings, um, and that was for the Fisher's Turico and a species of hornbill. The grounds at Leeds Castle are superb. The Woodland Walk is my favourite. It's a beautiful way to relax after your tour through the castle and gardens. One of the most friendly and user-friendly castles that I've ever seen. A lot of people like the fact that they feel they could live here, and Americans particularly say frequently this is the only castle they've visited that they could imagine living in. And, of course, it was lived in by um, Lady Bailey until just 20 years ago, and she was half American, so maybe that's why they feel at home. Oh, it's beautiful. Just exquisite. This is just absolutely breathtaking. And it's just Leeds Castle. It's just one of the most famous and loveliest of all the castles. Favorite with the queens, I heard, and I can see why. 